Now would be a good time to subscribe, hit the notification bell for future updates, and enjoy the beautiful view. I was on my way to the Griffith Park Observatory, but decided to stop by the beach first to get in some exercise. After a rigorous workout, I like to cool down with a nice walk by the water, which is surprisingly warm today, as the surf in California is usually brisk as the current comes down from Alaska. I actually didn't plan on coming here at all today, but that's life. You never know what you're about to step into and sometimes just have to make the best of the situation and work with what you have. An icon of Los Angeles, Griffith Park is the largest urban wilderness municipal park in the United States, filled with hiking trails, nature, wildlife, and of course, the famous Hollywood sign. The views from up here are spectacular, from downtown LA to the Pacific Ocean, and an extensive array of space and science-related displays, including a massive telescope available for the public to use, as admission has been free since the observatory's opening in 1935, in accordance with the will of Griffith J. Griffith, the benefactor after whom the observatory is named. The Astronomer's Monument is a large outdoor concrete sculpture on the front lawn of the observatory that pays homage to six of the greatest astronomers of all time, Hipparchus, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and Herschel. Over 7 million people have been able to view through the 12-inch refractor since the observatory's 1935 opening, and this is the most people to have viewed through any telescope. In his will, Griffith donated funds to build an observatory, exhibit hall, and planetarium on over 3,000 acres of land he donated to Los Angeles with the stated goal to make astronomy accessible to the public as opposed to the prevailing idea that observatories should be located on remote mountaintops and restricted to scientists. The building combines Greek and 19th century French neoclassicism as well as Gothic and Renaissance elements all under a large central dome. The planetarium shows at the observatory are offered several times a day and are very child friendly and a much better way for kids to spend their time in Hollywood instead of watching the actual propaganda content produced by Hollywood. For those that are interested, I will be hosting some free guided tours here where I'll be focusing on some of the more esoteric science exhibits inside, such as a large Tesla coil, which is on display since the 1930s. In the early 20th century, engineer and inventor Nikola Tesla made the astonishing claim that he was receiving radio communications from Mars. This was during the development of wireless technology where sending and receiving electromagnetic waves through the air offered new methods of searching for communications from space. An article from the Richmond Times offered an extensive description and commentary on his alleged discovery. Quote, 
as he sat besides his instrument on the hillside in Colorado in the deep silence of the austere, inspiring region where you plant your feet in gold and your head brushes the constellations, as he sat there one evening, alone, his attention, exquisitely alive at the juncture, was arrested by a faint sound from the receiver. Three fairy taps, one after the other, at a fixed interval. What man who has ever lived on this earth would not envy Tesla at that moment? Of course, much of Nikola Tesla's work is still classified as it pertains to national security, as if World War II never really ended. However, a considerable amount of interesting direct quotes were published before the war. Quote, We are getting messages from the clouds 100 miles away, possibly many times that distance. Do not leak it to the reporters. Movements on instruments repeated many times concludes it to be a message from another planet. The feeling is constantly growing on me that I've been the first to hear the greetings of one planet to another. I refer to the strange electrical disturbances, the discovery which I announced six years ago. At that time, I was only certain that they were of planetary origin. Now, after mature thought and study, I've come to the positive conclusion that they must emanate from Mars. 22 years ago, while experimenting in Colorado with a wireless power plant, I obtained extraordinary experimental evidence of the existence of life on Mars. I had perfected a wireless receiver of extraordinary sensitiveness, far beyond anything known, and I caught signals which I interpreted as meaning one, two, three, four. I believe the Martians use numbers for communication because numbers are universal. In 1899, while experimenting with a wireless receiver of extraordinary sensitivity, I detected faint signals from Mars, our brother planet. I could not interpret the signals, but they seemed to suggest a numerical code. One, two, three, four. As radio took off, so did stories of communicating with Mars. Similar signals observed by the Italian engineer Guglielmo Marconi even received attention from Thomas Edison, who was quoted as saying, Marconi's work offers good grounds for the theory that inhabitants of other planets are trying to signal to us. While the American media of the 30s and 40s diligently dismissed the signals as not having an extraterrestrial origin, the nationalist Germans were not so quick to dismiss the work of Nikola Tesla and others and embraced esoteric theories as not only plausible but probable. Keep in mind that the Allied powers were busy promoting scientific frauds such as the alleged missing link called the Piltdown Man, which stood prominently in the British Museum for almost the entire first half of the 20th century, which turned out to be a bleached baboon or orangutan jaw glued on to a human skull. The German secret societies, scientists, and government laughed at this fraud and were convinced that humanity's ancestors did not come down from the trees, but rather came up to the surface from below and even proposed that our genetic human relatives populate the heavens. Of course, former SS officers like Werner von Braun, who went on to a prominent role in NASA after the war, as did thousands of other German scientists, who all took the ancient myths and legends about Atlantis seriously as attested to by the names of their shuttles, including one named Atlantis. If you follow this channel for any length of time, you've probably heard me speculate about the capital of the Atlantean Empire being somewhere in the Atlantic around the Azores Islands, with the archipelago being the top remnants of the antediluvian mountains. Keeping that in mind, 
Here's a photo published by NASA of the space shuttle Atlantis to the side of the Canary Islands to the west where the Azores Islands would be. Surely just a coincidence as almost the entire upper echelon of NASA was comprised of people whose education included theories put forth by the Ananerbe, the Nationalist German Anthropology Department, which not only believed in the fable of Atlantis, but claimed direct descent from its noble inhabitants. In the distant past, the Atlanteans, the fourth root race of creation, had split into pure and bestial species. After many thousands of years, the pure race, the Aryan godmen of the fifth root race, had interbred with the beasts. The result was catastrophic decline and the near loss of the Aryan psychic powers. In the eyes of many Nazis, Atlantis was the mythical homeland of the Aryan race. They thought that they would be tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. The Aryans, a mythical and superior race, had invented everything of value in human history. From agriculture to architecture, the creation of theater, and fine art. This great Aryan culture came to life thousands of years ago, an island continent they believed existed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. To find a trace of these ancestors, the Nazis trained their sights on the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. They saw this as being sort of the southern edge of this sort of mythical Atlantean continent. And they also were really kind of focused on accounts of mummies that had been found on the Canary Islands that had blonde, kind of blonde hair. The mummies had been examined. They claimed the blonde-haired mummies were proof that Atlanteans had once lived on the Canary Islands. And most importantly, they were Aryans. Now that they had proof of an Atlantean fatherland, the Nazi scientists concocted an even more bizarre theory to explain its destruction and disappearance. It was called the World Ice Theory. As the ice melted, these massive glaciers receded. Atlantis was simply scrubbed away, buried under the water. But what happened to the people? The inhabitants of Atlantis, according to this theory, then fled to various areas that were thought to be safe refuges. They would flee to Tibet, they would flee to the Bolivian Andes. An ancient occult legend that tells the story of a continent somewhere in the North Atlantic. There lived a race of super beings who had fallen from grace through evil and vice. The land was called Atlantis. A great flood wiped these beings off the face of the earth. But before they could all be destroyed, certain priests escaped by boat. These escaped priests believed by mystics to be the original race of Aryan godmen who were said to be the ancestors of all Indian and European people. Descended from the super beings of Atlantis, and that they had lost their powers by mating with mere mortals. The Nordic race did not evolve, but came directly down from heaven to settle on the Atlantic continent. Ancient immigrants from Atlantis had founded a great civilization in the high Himalayas. Here, survivors of the last cosmic catastrophe took shelter. This is the true cradle of the Aryan race. While the idea of a global seafaring civilization during the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, seems far-fetched to many, that's in the context of our modern education system, which, when banning religious studies from schools in favor of the Darwinian out-of-Africa model, their legal arguments were made under the backdrop of another scientific fraud, this time the Nebraska Man which was also presented as a missing link based on a tooth of what they claim was a human ancestor, complete with published images, all based on what later turned out to be a pig's tooth. While modern archaeologists and anthropologists are baffled by ancient sites like Gobeki Tepe, which dates back 11,500 years, the exact date given by Plato 
for when Atlantis was submerged, and the same geologic date for the end of the Pleistocene and start of our current Holocene, the German and Anurbe investigated ancient mythology and sacred Aryan texts, such as those found in India, which described Vimana, or flying vehicles, in remote antiquity, and according to German scientists and American and Russian intelligence, managed to either back-engineer or recreate with otherworldly assistance what are essentially called flying saucers. This is why the modern UFO phenomena had its genesis during World War II with the battle above Los Angeles, California. Between the late evening of February 24, 1942 and the early morning hours of February 25th, the City of Angels went into a state of panic as what were initially believed to be German or Japanese enemy aircraft were spotted over the city. Taking place on the heels of the Pearl Harbor bombing, and just one day after a confirmed submarine attack off the Santa Barbara coast, the UFO sighting touched off a massive barrage of anti-aircraft fire with some 1,400 shells shot into the skies above Los Angeles and lasting the better part of the evening. Many people believe the aircraft were extraterrestrial, with one eyewitness even describing an object he's seen as looking like an enormous flying lozenge, and some accusing the government of a cover-up, especially after conflicting accounts of the incident from the Navy and War Department. As if to confirm public fears of extraterrestrial attack, one famous LA Times photograph emerged from the incident showing an ominous, saucer-like object hovering over the city. This much-debated photograph inspired America's first major UFO controversy a full five years before Roswell. And now for news of our own West Coast, we take you to Los Angeles and the report of Byron Palmer. Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific War Time this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. However, it required nearly 30 minutes to travel some 25 miles, far slower than an airplane. Watchers on the rooftop of the Columbia Broadcasting Building in the heart of Hollywood could plainly see the flashes of guns and searchlights sweeping the skies in a wide arc along the coastal area. Concussion of the shells could be felt in downtown Los Angeles, 15 miles away. U.S. Army planes quickly took to the dark skies, but whether they contacted the object has not been announced. Army officials say they will not comment until they receive a full report of the action. Although some watchers say they saw airplanes in the air, semi-official sources say they probably were the U.S. Army's pursuit. Several observers say they saw one or more planes spotlighted by 20 or 30 searchlights. The object moved southward presumably over Huntington Park at the western edge of Los Angeles and on southward to about Long Beach on the coast. By 3.30 a.m., observers said the object appeared to be over the south of Long Beach. Searchlights closely followed the object down the coast and kept it centered in their glare. Shells frequently could be seen bursting near the object, but none appeared to hit it. The shooting stopped about 3.30 a.m. The shooting brought warfare to the front door of this city of a million and a quarter population for the first time since December 7th. Already it was alert to the presence off the Southern California coast of a Japanese submarine which had pumped 25 shells into an oil field north of Santa Barbara Monday evening. Because of the presence of the submarine, a three-hour alert was ordered at dusk last night and civilian authorities stood at their posts while the Army and Navy continued their search for the submersible. The evening alert ended at 10.23 p.m., but another was sounded at 2.22 a.m., and the blackout followed within three minutes. 
It covered Los Angeles County from Santa Monica to Pomona. At 2.27, all Southern California radio stations were ordered off the air, except those in San Diego. Approximately 20 minutes after the firing died down, the ship returned and headed westward from Long Beach toward Santa Monica. The guns went into action again, hurling round after round of shells at the object. The second barrage appeared to be closer to downtown Los Angeles, since watchers could hear the concussion of the guns more clearly and the flash of bursting shells was brighter. Then the ship disappeared for the second time over the ocean. We return you now to CBS in New York. The Battle of Los Angeles did in fact claim six lives. Three civilians were killed directly by friendly fire, while three others suffered heart attacks during the event. A number of buildings were also damaged by a barrage of more than 1,400 shells from anti-aircraft guns, with no visible effect on the craft itself. It eventually drifted leisurely south towards Long Beach and vanished from view. Some people have suggested that the Japanese were launching planes from a secret base in Mexico, while others theorized that they had developed a submarine capable of carrying aircraft. Of course, the Germans were also rumored to have U-boats large enough to launch aircraft from, but for some reason, many technological aspects of World War II is still, still kept classified, as is Operation High Jump, where the Allied Armed Forces invaded Antarctica in 1946 with a massive armada consisting of thousands of soldiers and three aircraft carriers, yet the public is still kept in the dark despite over 70 years having passed since the United States, Britain, and the other allies suffered their mysterious defeat in 1947. It's almost as if there's still some sort of threat that remains out there. Otherwise, why the secrecy? And to whom exactly would this threat be directed at? An eyewitness testimonial to the events that transpired over Los Angeles in 1942 was William Tompkins, who worked for the Navy during World War II and before passing away recently at the age of 94, went public about what he claims was advanced German technology and the reality of people from other worlds. Here is Bill Tompkins on the Jeff Rents program. Please tell me, Bill, Battle of L.A., 1942, uh, extraterrestrials over Los Angeles. Uh, most people were told it was Japanese, but it wasn't. Uh, tell us what you know, Bill, what you saw. Well, actually, uh, we were living in Long Beach at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 around 7 o'clock, my brother and I were reading the newspaper on the floor. My dad called us and told us to come out onto the deck. We were on the second floor of a very large house that was in four, broken up into four apartments. And so they had a big deck way up. And we couldn't, we were four blocks of the ocean. So we couldn't see the water, but we could see uh, the area above it. And here was this bright light. And all three of us were looking at it. We called some of the neighbors, and he came out on their deck. We all looked at it. And uh, while we were watching it for several minutes, a tiny beam came out of it in, at about a 45-degree angle to the left and went down towards the ocean. Uh -huh. uh, that beam then flipped up directly towards our apartment. Huh. Hit the back of the apartment, hit the trees, lit up everything around us, and You're went kidding. out. It went. It, somebody knew you were watching. That's wild. That didn't just happen. It was weird. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, this was was uh, this was this Bill? Excuse me. Was this before or after the anti-aircraft had uh, unloaded? Was it four thousand rounds or something at this object, or is this the second object? This what was do you before, think? No. This this was before, because okay. uh, later in the evening, the aircraft started firing. Okay. And incidentally, what has not been published is the number of U.S. Navy 
They had aircraft guns. We had the whole fleet at that time, and they used up all of their 20-millimeter, 40-millimeter, and 5-inch guns. Firing out of, out of, where were they anchored? L.A. Harbor? No, Long yeah, Beach? They were in Long Beach Harbor. And they were shooting at this? Wow. Nobody talks and about that. The Coast, Ar the Coast Artillery was firing at them. And, of course, searchlights. We had eight searchlights on this one big one that came in and it parked. And it was there for over an hour. Right, yeah. Uh, different ones came above it, came beside it, came underneath it. The searchlights would pull off of the big one and follow the smaller ones and try to shoot them down. Uh, and it continued, but finally it got boring, so we went back to bed around 3. I have never our heard this before. That's fascinating. Go ahead. Our, our neighbors stayed the whole night, and they said that it really didn't stop uh, till around almost 5 o'clock. But the next day, there was articles in the paper that they thought there had been some uh, military aircraft coming in. It was just a cover-up. Sure, of course. But, but my dad was like your friend. Uh, he was the guy that was responsible for that area. And, of course, he talked to everybody. And uh, the interesting thing to me was that nobody got excited. Nobody got upset. There weren't any heart attacks. And while this was going on, over in London... Germany was bombing London, and those people were trying to get underneath the ground so they didn't get killed. Mm -hmm. And if we have vehicles above us at less than 8,000 feet, most of them, right. they were real high. And nobody was fast. All of them were slow. And many of them just parked. Many of them what? Say that, say that again, Bill. Many of them were... Mm -hmm. Many of them just parked. They stopped. And they okay. parked there. Wow. The, they, yeah, they, the, 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 and, and this is right in Long Beach. This is uh, astonishing because we've only heard, Bob, you know this, the standard story on the Battle of L.A. was that there was one craft slowly meandering its way from the Culver City, Santa Monica Mountains area, all the way down to Long Beach before it, quote, disappeared. That's well, all we, two, that's there, all there we were heard. two public releases. Uh, one of them was uh, unclassified ones that we fired 1,432 rounds of ammunition. Uh -huh. And then, of course, there was a top-secret release uh, that, uh, that said that they re recovered one craft that had been shot down and, and uh, had crashed in San Bernardino Mountains, and the other craft was salvaged by the Navy at sea. Okay, hold on. Uh, I've heard rumor that one went down by Long Beach offshore and went into the water, crashed. Correct. Uh, I've heard another rumor that something went down in, I think it was El Monte, and a truck, a big low boy, a flatbed truck came in, and that may have been an American uh, fighter that was up there and got hit by our own friendly fire. I don't know. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't know that case. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from a, a top secret a majestic document. Uh, oh, my. Okay. So, two of these, <laughs> you'd think that they'd know better than to park while they're getting shot at, but uh, two were shot down, or one was damaged and it crashed in the ocean. The other went down the San Bernardino Mountains. The big one, we'll call that the mothership just for fun, uh, moved off and apparently was undamaged. You can see the pictures of the Battle of Los Angeles and you can see the exploding AA all around this thing and on it, and it, was not, it wasn't damaging the big one. The right. smaller craft perhaps were scout craft, and they weren't so heavily able to, uh, to withstand the bombardment. They, now, what Bill just said is that the ships in Long Beach emptied their magazines. They had no more ammo to fire. So that would, that would jack up the 1,700 round number to thousands. Well, it would, and this was an Army report, so they probably didn't count the Navy rounds. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, okay, uh, Bill. It was, inter it was interesting that uh, there, were, there were several ships in the Navy dry docks in San Pedro. Yes. And they, they didn't even have most of their crews there, but the crews that were there grabbed their guns 
they got their ammunition, and they're firing from ships that are in dry dock. They're not even in the water. That's amazing. They, they weren't even in the water. That's <laughs> <laughs> if you recall, uh, Bill, uh, where were we last time when we let off uh, in, in the narrative, and where would you like to pick it up? Uh, well, we sort of left off uh, in the middle, really. And uh, if we could, I'd like to uh, go back to, uh, like, 1942, if we could uh, start okay. there. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's a uh, situation which I think is uh, uh, hard for people to, to realize. The uh, German people, of course, were never allowed to even know that this extraterrestrial assistance had been given to the SS. Now, the point here is that... Uh, this meant that the Germans were totally more advanced and capable of uh, learning how to operate these vehicles right. and go out in space. When I was working for Admiral Riccobana in 1942, and he had these uh, 29 uh, top Navy operatives, spies, in Germany, uh, and they had been in there for at least a year before I got into it, uh -huh. and they came back as quickly as they could as they got no information. Now, this and is an amazing so penetration that American intelligence was able to somehow get, obviously, men who were fluent in German uh, and got credentials and, and papers to get them somehow placed in positions of extreme importance in the Third Reich. They were naval operatives, naval spies, and these fellows were brilliant. And so they got into all of the air, most of the areas in Germany and the occupied uh, countries. And they found out there were all of these things that were going to take place where Germany then would have uh, UFOs with speeds capable of uh, uh, close to the speed of light. They had weapons which were uh, so advanced there was nothing that we had here in the United States had any idea of it. And so the Germans quickly uh, got themselves, put these program of these vehicles in production. And unlike the United States, we had to take the information that the uh, Navy operatives gave us, mm -hmm. disseminate it out to all of the top, top secret organizations in the United States, Navy facilities, universities, uh, Caltech, JPL, all uh, of Lockheed, Douglas, Boeing, everybody right. got packages, okay? But our position was totally different than the Germans in that several years went by before there was two UFOs that even crashed and that we could look at them. Yeah, 1947, yeah. That's right. And so uh, it's extremely interesting that we had to try to reverse engineer everything in those UFOs that were crashed. This took us years. Yeah, the Whereas, Germans didn't have that obstacle. But there, there are obviously people out there right now, Bill, that are saying, what the heck? If they had this technology, how did they lose the war? Okay, uh, that's uh, an extremely good question. And uh, the easiest way to answer it is that they actually did not lose the war. Uh, we didn't win the war. What happened was that the Germans uh, were contacted by all of the U.S. Navy and all of the naval or military intelligence groups in the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. They went in and made arrangements to take a substantial number of German scientists and bring them to the United States. Yeah, it's it's called the paperclip program. Thousands of them, yeah. There were lots and lots of them. And it wasn't like there were uh, six or seven of them. Uh, like you said, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Now, these Germans then actually uh, 
were uh, assigned into uh, a thing called NASA. And they essentially made up 80 to 90 percent of NASA, but that wasn't wow. their stop. They continued mm -hmm. to uh, distribute out through every top U.S. biomedical and corporations that were in uh, aerospace mm -hmm. uh, companies. Right. And they, they then worked in these companies, and they worked to the extent that they took over the finance of these companies, uh, uh, and of course the Bilderberg and the Trilateral all involved in this. Mm -hmm. But the point is that Germany had four years before they lost the war, they decided that this, this tremendous opportunity that was given to them uh, to have all of these advanced space systems, uh, they said, we're going to move it to Antarctica. And at that particular time, uh, extraterrestrials had three large caverns uh, under the ground, under the ice, down in Antarctica. And they uh -huh. had two small ones. Right. And so they gave the two small ones to the SS. And they then made arrangements uh, so that the Germans would design and build massive uh, submarines as transports. Now, they had no torpedoes on board. They were just... Right. large right. transports. And they started moving the top uh, UFO uh, construction because Germany went into the construction of these various types of UFOs that were given to them. And they started taking this four years before the war ended. Really? So they had a massive number of uh, slaves, slave labor, labor yeah. that they yeah. moved down there too. And the families for all of the uh, German SS uh -huh. uh, went down there with them. Well, these caverns, now I have uh, footage of the original 1938-39 uh, German expedition to Antarctica. Now, that yes. that trip, as you know, was captured on, on film and brought back, and, and, and a re, uh, certainly a screened version of it was edited and released to German movie houses. It was like a newsreel. It was like a 10, 12-minute piece of film that showed the German exploration research ships going down to Antarctica. Now, my question is, in these films are some snapshots of gigantic underground caverns. I'm going to pull all these out of the films. They're old and grainy, but they're still watchable. They have uh, Wagnerian music and a little bit of a soundtrack from a narrator here and there. But they're a, it's a remarkable thing to see because this is what they admitted finding in Antarctica. And my question is, Bill, how do they go down there to this continent of ice and find these caverns just out of the blue on this trip down there? They had to be shown where they were. Had to be. Exactly. It's the terrestrial people. Right. And uh, they, those, uh, those caverns, actually, uh, they, uh, they were like massive countries. Uh, well, the pictures the, I have, they, there may be, uh, I'm going to guess, like mm, oh, a, th a third to a half a mile across, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet tall, enormous caverns under the ice, no ice to be seen, running water, uh, perfectly habitable. Yes, and right next to them are these three massive caverns. Well, I they, believe it. I believe it. Yeah. But really, and, and so what took place then is that as we were, uh, the 8th Air Force uh, and the British were taking Germany out by the bombings, um, we were like minutes, not years, from uh, losing that war. But it didn't make any difference to Germany because uh, not less, not just Hitler and his girlfriend uh, went to South America, uh, and uh, so did 
many of the Germans, and oh, they found... Bormann, Jews. Mengele, there's, yeah, lots of them down there. Thousands. And so this whole thing all took place. They infiltrated our aerospace and our advanced medical systems here mm-hmm. in the country. Uh, and essentially, they got NASA, which then, of course, they were running, uh, to to the Apollo missions, which were German missions, before they left Germany and went right. to Antarctica. Right. These, these were, that's what Germany was doing. So they came over here, and they did the same thing here. I don't think we sit down and sort of evaluate the timeline of all of this. I no. think it's kind of uh, hard to believe you didn't win the war. Uh, and it's very hard to realize even today that uh, this is a still a major controlling element in the United States and actually in England, too. Uh-huh. So it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, ex- extraordinary. Antarctica, advanced technology. NASA, a German operation. The Germans put us in space. The Germans took us to the moon if we went to the moon, and most people think we did. Uh, we did. They absolutely were behind the construction, and Bill was a designer of some of these enormous spaceships, there's no other word for them, that were constructed apparently either in pieces down here or built in space. What was the truth of it, Bill? Are we talking about Solar Warden? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the the designs for some of these were at the Douglas uh, Santa Monica Engineering Facilities in a sec- secret uh, think tank. What years uh, that would that have been, done. Bill? Excuse me. What years approximately would that have been? That's uh, 42, 46, uh, that time period. Okay, so that's and, during uh, the war, folks. They were designing spacecraft at Douglas Aircraft during the war years. All right. And, of course, we were using the information that the, uh, in Admiral Riccoboni's office, uh, he was the commander of Naval Air Station San Diego, and that was his published a mission. Nobody knew what he was actually doing with these operatives coming back from Germany with all this space information. Right. So then, uh, later on, I went to work for Douglas and in the secret think tank, and one of the interesting things is one of the packages, proposal packages that I flew around the country on for all this information to be disseminated to uh, the aerospace organizations. Uh, I found one of my own packages that I had done 10 years, 12 years before that I'd given wow. it to Douglas. I'll be done. Crazy. That is crazy. Wow. Okay. So my question about these enormous craft for, you heard uh, Bill mention it, and if you didn't understand, it was Solar Warden, like the man who runs a prison, a protector, a guard. Solar Warden is the name of the program. These big craft that were built, how were they constructed and where were they constructed? That's the big deal. Were they constructed down here and flown into space? Must have been. Okay. Uh, no, they were not. Uh, ah, the, well, uh, see. There you go. Okay. Uh, one of the uh, facilities that was used is uh, uh, east of the Wasatch Mountains in Utah. And uh, this is a very, very large cavern. It uh, has smaller ones adjacent to it, but it's a massive one. And they were able to put together Lockheed Space Systems, Northrop Grumman facilities, even uh, Boeing were involved in the actual construction of these kilometer-long spacecraft carriers that the Navy now has eight of these spacecraft carrier battle groups out in the galaxy. And uh, uh, I don't know the actual mission right now, but for most of the period since the first ones were built and went out into the galaxy, because they were built here, uh, they were operating with only one of the eight uh, who operated around the solar system. The others were out in the galaxy 
but jointly working with the Nordic Navy. And uh, who are the people that uh, has been assisting at least us on the Apollo? Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, the actual vehicles are built uh, somewhat like an aircraft type thing, aircraft uh, carrier. And it's interesting that Northrop, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh-huh. put together a program where they went back to Virginia and uh, they bought the largest aircraft carrier construction facility on the planet. Hmm. And uh, uh, they bought this so they, that they could have their engineers come in and work with all of the Navy construction and engineering people that build these aircraft. So this was a huge shipyard construction location. It has to be. Because yeah. so they, float, a, they, it, float the, uh, they float the completed vessels in, into some water somewhere. Okay. And so this is Newport News uh, ship, shipyard okay. in Virginia. And so they then had their people, uh, the Grumman people, uh, study with the Navy engineers, designers of the of all the areas of an aircraft carrier. And surprisingly enough, uh, Newport News also builds Navy submarines. And so, at Douglas, yeah. uh, hold on, at Douglas, uh, uh, in the secret think tank, when we were looking at every type of space vehicle we would need to go out into the galaxy, the Navy, or the U.S. Navy. And so submarines uh, came up, and we discussed this. And we said, that's the easiest thing, the quickest way we can get out there. We'll just take a regular nor- uh, Navy submarine, pull out the old uh, nuclear system, put in the anti-gravitational system, and we're going to use these right away. So this was in the 1950s. Yes. All right. Uh, this is. Uh, I was going to ask about propulsion. So we were given or otherwise back engineered anti gravitational propulsion systems, which went into the actual submarine that was being built. Very simple conversion, actually. Very smart. Yes. And back tonight is a remarkable friend of ours and a friend of yours. His name is William Tompkins. Bill has been a guest a number of times. Uh, Bill, what have you heard from people who have listened to the earlier programs? What what are you getting in terms of feedback? What kinds of comments from people? Oh, kind of interesting, really. Uh, getting calls from uh, France and getting calls from Russia and uh, really the United States, but wow. amazing. And uh, so, uh, all your efforts to get the program around the planet are, are certainly successful, uh, and I, I'm amazed. It's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, people in Russia calling, very interesting. Well, it just seems like uh, maybe what we should do is back off just a little bit and kind of open this, this program up. Uh, there's, there's one, gosh, there's one real important thing I think we all need to we need to address it. We need to try to relate to it. Sure. Um, Go to it. The, uh, this, this universe is a very, very big place to be. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, as many as 200 billion galaxies exist out there. We didn't talk about planetary systems like the solar system. Now, these uh, are galaxies like the Milky Way. Hey, these are galaxies, These are 200 galaxies. billion, at least. <laughs> at least 200 billion. And then we have billions, billions of stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Oh, my gosh. And, and so for us to take this approach, which unfortunately we've been lied to, like you said, um, that there's no other people uh, out there in the universe but us, uh, it's kind of naive. That's and, it's ridiculous uh, is what it is. It's absolutely absurd to even say something as dumb as that. Good Lord. Uh, 
200 billion galaxies, all with over billions of stars. <laughs> My gosh. And these stars, most of these stars have planets. Yeah. Like the little solar system that we have. Right. Some of them have two, two stars. Uh, some even have three stars. That would be a hard place to live. You wouldn't really? know whether three. it was day or night. Three suns. Yes. How, how wild would that be? A binary would be tough enough, but three? Yeah. Wow. Wild. And, but just to, to think that we're part of this situation and that uh, people have been cruising, uh, certainly not just the Milky Way galaxy, all of these other galaxies for probably billions of years. And so we're just touching the tip of the iceberg when we're talking about this subject. And yes. I think it's, uh, I think people should write that number down and every once in a while just look at it and stop and think of what we're, we're, we're now visualizing. We can go out into the desert or we can go out of town and just on a nice clear night look up at the sky. There's hundreds of thousands of stars that we can see. Oh my gosh, you know, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Even astronomy is fantastic. Uh, and our position in this uh, is unbelievably uh, more important than maybe we think. But uh, we are just now learning what's going on. And I think that the more we can discuss this, this whole subject, uh, the better we are all are going to be. And uh, sort of tonight, I would I don't know what uh, you folks were going to say, but I would sort of like to talk about the galaxy itself. And, uh, oh, that's fine. A little, bit, yeah. a little bit about where we are in it. And uh, uh, essentially, the situation of, uh, say, hypothetical cases where you will accept that other people are out there in the galaxy. They're cruising the galaxy. Uh, some of them are just grandchildren with grandma and grandpa on a cruise ship, a cruise galaxy ship, cruising the galaxy, having a ball. Others are coming here. They take a look at us. They don't pay much attention, and they go on to the rest of their cruise. So it's and, tour, and, tourism exists on the basis that you're describing it. I've I've often poked fun at that knowledge that people coming here as tourists would see quite a show <laughs> on this yeah, planet. You're right, really. Uh, uh, and, and I think maybe when they could just look at how we don't necessarily get along with each other, uh, they could they could be laughing all the way to the next part of the galaxy. I, uh, yeah. I agree with it, you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, this could be fun. And uh, how many gal how many have. galaxies again? Now, can, keep in mind when you look up at the Milky Way, friends, and it stretches from horizon to horizon, a band of these bright, concentrated dots of light. Uh, that's our little, relatively speaking, galaxy. That's a, it's an enormous place. That this galaxy. How many galaxies? Tell them again that we know about or can project are out there in the known universe? We have over 200 billion galaxies, <laughs> all of them with billions of stars. And I think this is really important to address. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to get ourselves out of this everyday thing that we're forced into and stop and think that we now have this opportunity for instance, to join with other Nordic people and go out into the galaxy with them. Not all that stuff about the wars going on and all the bad side of it, but stop and think of our opportunities. We're just around the corner. We will be able to cruise ships out in the galaxy ourselves. I, in, I just in, think that in it's our, yeah. invigorating. In our Milky Way galaxy, we wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to take a cruise through the Milky Way? Wow. And that's probably being done, as Bill is saying, by other intelligent forms of life in this galaxy right now. Would it explain certainly some of the enormous craft that we've seen 
in our atmosphere down near ground level. Enormous craft, huge craft. Think of the Phoenix Lights. These craft are over a mile wide, some of them. Just enormous. And they could be cruise ships, for all we know. Uh, it's true. And it is an amazing thing to contemplate. We're kept, Bill, in such a, a little uh, thimble, a little mental prison by the controls of this planet. We have a birthright to know about what you've just mentioned. We have a birthright to think about the absolute enormity of 200 billion galaxies, each with billions of stars like our own sun. Uh, we don't think about that. We're not talked to about that. We're not told about that. We're not encouraged to ponder that. We're encouraged to feel subservient, trapped, in debt, and under great stress all the time in this little microcosm we call planet Earth. Beautiful. Well put. Really. Uh, it's astounding. And uh, actually, what we're going into, instead of being negative, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to enjoy what takes place. I'm going to put a sign out on my lawn. I'm ready. Uh, land... <laughs> Land here, whatever. Uh, there are a lot of people listening who are probably saying much the same thing. It would be wonderful to get off this, uh, this place. The change in our perspective and our, our hopes and dreams would be instantaneous. And a lot of people, contactees, abductees, have, have had that experience, uh, for better or worse. And there are people out there listening right now who, who know the truth. It's like having which I, I did, I had an, I call it an after-death experience. When you realize that there is no death, when you get off this planet and realize that there is life everywhere, it's an instantaneous change that you can never retreat from. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I, I agree with you 100%, really. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that uh, we're, we're in this learning curve, which is right now going straight up across the charts. Uh, we're being exposed to reality. We're being, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're learning what we should have learned in the university and in the schools, but it wasn't taught because these people were controlling us and, uh, giving us a difficult time. And I think that, uh, trying to, like you're saying, try to get out of this, atmosphere and into the positive sides of uh, there's a lot of really wonderful things taking place and uh, sort of uh, trying to put this thing together uh, uh, there's when we talk about the galaxies and we talk about the numbers of people or different civilizations that could be out there uh, actually we need to look at our opportunities and uh, the situation with certain extraterrestrials who are uh, assisting us, and I hate to go back to just a couple of three people uh, back at Douglas on the Apollo program, but uh, I, I have to sort of address that because uh, these three people that were helping us uh -huh. uh, were were... Nordic people, uh, essentially our cousins, if you want the truth. And uh, they come from a different part of the arm of the Milky Way galaxy that we're all in. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, uh, we're, we're way out in the boonies. I mean, our yeah. location uh, in this particular Milky Way galaxy, we're like out on the tip of one of the arms of the galaxy. Yeah, uh, we're not downtown where all the action is, <laughs> and so uh, come on. I mean, uh, uh, and so um, the opportunities are tremendous, and and so to address these three Nordic people, whose uh, whose thrust was nothing negative for nearly four years, they wanted us to be successful on the Apollo program. And when we talk about the Apollo program, I don't like to repeat things, but I think it's something that's important. Fine, because it's fine to repeat. Just going to the moon was not the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. The Apollo program 
phase one was to build a 10,000 man naval research and operating base on the moon, only it was inside because we were going to build it underground. Uh, that was phase one. Mm-hmm. Phase two of the Apollo was to build naval stations on every habitable planet in the solar system or their moons. Okay? Phase three was to do exactly the same thing on the 12 closest stars. We just explained the real Apollo mission. So when we're trying to put together requirements for the vehicle or for the launch vehicle or for the mission, Mm -hmm. we're not just addressing getting there. We're addressing all the things that we need to do because these are stepping stones for phase two and phase three. Okay. So when we got shot down, go ahead. Uh-huh. A question for our so hold that thought. When we got shot down, a question for our listeners. I think what you're clearly putting on the table is the simple fact that the NASA Apollo program, as it was presented and marketed to the public, was essentially a diversion. And uh, so, when you look at uh, your moon, which is not yours. And then you stop and think that, uh, well, wait a minute, maybe this is not your planet either, because a whole bunch of people are out there using this planet as a laboratory. So in the Apollo program, those two wonderful young ladies and that healthy-looking Nordic guy who helped us on the Apollo program to make it successful for nearly three and a half years. I think that uh, all of the discussion for those periods of time with these three people never made one negative comment. Everything was plus. Everything was for accomplishment, developing it, methods. And yes, they are very smart people. Uh, they come from a different part of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, they are, they were here to help us join them out in the galaxy and help us fix our own planet. These were the missions. These were what these people were doing. And there wasn't one single time in the entire time that there was anything negative. Everything was plus. And to realize that you have these three people, even though most of engineering did not accept they were extraterrestrial, and it was a big joke, uh, they really were. And they really did accomplish the basic problem areas on the program. Yes, uh, they would, in the meetings, they would suggest to me telepathically, they're not in the meeting, We got 10 or 12 of us fighting over some item. Uh, She slipped that answer into my head. I come up with it, and it's the answer or the fix for that part of the Apollo program. Oh, come on here. Even when my assistant, section chief, and I are on the Douglas DC-7s flying down to the Cape, where we've got... uh, these facilities being built for the Apollo launches. Yeah. And we're flying there asking ourselves, gee whiz, are we, uh, like my assistant said to me, uh, Bill, uh, is this safe? And I said, what do you mean is this safe? For both of us to be going down there. I mean, holy cow, you know, she can do anything back there. Uh, she could sell a program to our uh, to, to Boeing, our, our competition. <laughs> uh, she could sell it to the Russians. Uh, uh, really, I think I should go back. And, yeah, and now, the, who is this? Who is this? Your your assistant? Yeah, my assistant, the section chief. Okay, and he was a real sweet guy. Yeah, and uh, and he got worried uh, that uh, that the the uh, the Nordic we woman both at the same time. That's funny. Well, what do you think? Is there a UFO cover up? 
or is New Berlin in Antarctica sci-fi fantasy for movies and video games? Es gibt ein Haus in Neu-Berlin, man nennt es Haus Abendrot. Es war der Ruin vieler guter Jungs, von mir mein Gott litt ich Not. Anführer zugehört, ich wäre heute daheim. War jung und dumm, war ein armer Jung, auf den Abweg geführt und gemein. In a world that's so heavily censored, even in places that hold free speech as sacred, it could be hard to separate factual events from embellishment. That said, things seem to fall in place when one examines the motives for secrecy, namely to keep the status quo in the energy and banking sectors, both of which are fundamental to maintaining the global power structure in place where both industries would cease to exist if free and clean energy technology were to be introduced to our planet. While few could dismiss German ingenuity, the nationalist scientists themselves insist that they have been assisted, believe that this help came from human civilizations that do not originate on Earth, and maintain that we are unwitting slaves on a planet that not only is held back in terms of technology, but inundated with so much propaganda from a controlled media and academia that most people are unaware that our minds are enslaved as well. If you're ever in Santa Monica, the sushi at Noma's is excellent. Bon appetit and thanks for listening. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon as well as through various other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.